May I get your attention? Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to welcome you uh, for this uh, uh, conference, or let's say discussion, about the European copyright reform uh, that you probably know something about, because you are here, right? Uh, otherwise, if, if you don't, uh, you'll definitely learn something today. Uh, I would like first to introduce our uh, speakers today. I'll start uh, with uh, the man on my left. <laughs> um, his name is Dimitar Dimitrov, uh, and he's a free knowledge ambassador uh, of Wikimedia Deutschland. He works in Brussels, so uh, it wasn't far away, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, he didn't take a direct route to the Belgian capital, actually. Uh, he has lived in many different European capitals, uh, which made him truly cosmopolitan. And apart from his native Bulgarian, uh, Dimi also speaks fluent English and German and acquired French en passant. <laughs> so, welcome, Dimi. <laughs> Uh, next, there's Ellen Broad. Um, she joined the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, in 2013 as manager, digital projects and policy. Prior to commencing with IFLA, Ellen was executive officer for the Australian Digital Alliance, advocating for balanced and flexible copyright laws in the public interest on behalf of a range of sectors spanning IT, education, consumer organizations, and libraries and archives. In her roles, Ellen has advised governments on copyright policy issues, participate as an expert resource in international policy consultations and trade negotiations, and spoken extensively on copyright and related access to information issues around the world. So, welcome, Ellen, also. <laughs> uh, the third speaker today is Melanie Dulong de Rosny. Uh, she's a permanent rece researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research, Institute for Communication Sciences, and a visiting fellow at London School of Economics and Political Science Department of Media and Communications. Uh, she graduated in Political Sciences as a PhD in Law, Associated Researcher at CERSA, where she was Creative Commons France Legal Lead between 2003 and 2013. She has been a research fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society of Harvard Law School and Science Commons and at the Institute for Information Law of the University of Amsterdam prior to joining uh, CNRS in 2010. She co-founded in 2011 Comunia International Association on the digital public domain, which she currently chairs and represents the World Intellectual Property Organization. She is regularly teaching copyright law. Welcome. <laughs> and last but not least uh, is Gabrielle Guillemin. Uh, she's a legal officer at Article 19, uh, which is an international free speech organization based in London. Gabriel has been leading Article 19's internet policy work since 2011. She is the author of the Right to Share Principles on Freedom of Expression and Copyright in the Digital Age and Internet uh, Intermediaries, Dilemma of Liability among other Article 19 publications. She is a member of the Council of Europe Committee of Experts on Cross-Border Flow of Internet Traffic and Internet Freedom and a member of the UK Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group on the Internet Governments. Prior to joining Article 19, Gabriel was a lawyer at the European Court of Human Rights for nearly four years. So welcome, also. <laughs> now, after the introduction, I would like uh, to pass the word uh, on to the first speaker, Dimitar. So if you can, <laughs> please. Yes, uh, well, um, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm for Wikimedia, and this is one of these rare occasions where I don't have to explain what Wikimedia is, um, because um, yeah, usually I really have to go in depth with this. But uh, well, let me just say that we are a global movement that um, has committed itself to bringing about a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all human knowledge. And uh, for the time being, we're doing this by um, gathering as much content as possible, uh, putting on it on wiki-based websites, and um, 
having all of this under free licenses, under Creative Commons licenses. Um, if you put now these two statements together that, that I just said, um, it is very easy to conclude that our ultimate legal goal is for Creative Commons to self-liquidate, not because we don't love Creative Commons, but because we want this to become the legal standard, the legal reality. Um, talking about copyright on the EU level and copyright in Brussels, um, we are very, very far away from being able to do anything like this. I mean, it's, it's, it's just not possible right now, but still, um, there are a lot of things going on right now. There is, um, as most of you will know, there was a consultation and we're waiting for a white paper before summer. Uh, and the next commission and the next European Parliament, although they probably will not want to deal with this, they will have to simply because everybody across the board from big industry to individual users is asking for is demanding a change in copyright. The demands are quite diverse, but um, I'm, I'm, my money is that's on the table and it's going to be one of the major reform uh, initiatives by the new commission. And um, while, as I said, I don't think a revolution, um, a breakthrough change is possible right now, I do believe that there are many little things we can tweak. There are a lot of patches we might have a chance to bring through. And um, they're a bit more realistic and um, they're very crucial because if we bring them through, um, this would change the narrative. I'm talking about like really tiny things here like having everything produced by uh, tax money uh, being in the public domain, by having the freedom of taking pictures of uh, publicly accessible buildings, sometime, something we do not have now in most member states. Um, I'm talking about an opt-in system for copyright, which we can also demand, which would solve the orphan works pro problem for um, a large extent. And I mean, we should of course never forget to ask for um, term, for shorter copyright terms. Um, these are really little things, but uh, here's why I think they're so crucial and so important. Um, the last time uh, the copyright terms were extended was in the 90s. This happened uh, despite report upon report upon report. There were, like, I think, three reports commissioned by the Commission saying that this is a very bad idea. Nevertheless, copyright was extended from lifelong plus 50 to lifelong plus 70 years. Back then, the debate, the narrative was very one-sided. There was no digital civil society. There were no net activists. There were no MEPs in this parliament born out of the internet. Um, Therefore, um, it is so important that uh, we all are here right now and that we are all are pushing for maybe even tiny things, maybe even real things. And um, the, the huge advantage of uh, pushing for real things is that uh, it makes it possible to put them on the table and keep them there. And once uh, you keep these little things on the table, you're part of the conversation. Once you're part of the conversation, um, we're not only talking anymore about what must be prohibited, we're starting to talk about what has to be allowed. Uh, we are changing the narrative and um, only by changing the narrative uh, will we actually be able to maybe one day in 10, 20, 30 years have a really meaningful uh, reform of copyright. And therefore, yes, um, the panel's topic is progress of the current copyright reform and my answer my view on this is that uh, the state of play is changing the narrative. Uh, our strategy right now is shifting the focus and um, the single most necessary and urgent thing we need is as many young and educated people going around and asking and promoting free and open stuff. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dimitar. And, um, now uh, it's time for the speech of the second speaker, Ellen Broad, if you can. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I might actually start where Dimi left off because I thought I might talk to you a little bit about my experiences with the European copyright consultation so far in comparison to some of the discussions we've had with other governments. Um, so the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions is a member of the Copyright for Creativity Coalition, so we've been quite heavily involved in the EU copyright consultation process. 
but also I've just come out of the Australian copyright reform consultation and also when I was working in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement we worked with the Asia-Pacific governments and I've done some work with the US. So I thought I'd talk about some of the kind of striking differences with the EU copyright consultation in comparison to the way we've discussed copyright in other regions to really articulate Dimi's point about the need to reframe the narrative. One of the things that's been really interesting to me from discussing copyright at the EU level, and unexpectedly I'd say, is how explicit industry interests are considered in copyright as opposed to the author's interests. We talk about the author's interests in Australia and in the United States and in other countries as well as quite often the industries behind those author's interests. So they'll use the language of author's rights to actually pursue an industry agenda. But what's been really striking to me in a lot of the discussions I've had in the EU with European Commission officials is that they're talking specifically about industry. Well, what impact will this have on industry business models? Um, the industry have told us that this will um, interfere with their ability to compete. We don't want to upset the industry. So the voice of the author, the voice of the artist, hasn't come prominently into the debate. So that was the first quite striking observation I made because particularly coming from a kind of outsider perspective, we have this view of the European Union and the European copyright tradition as being very author's rights focused, the birthplace of moral rights, the cultural tradition, the, um, the protection of cultural heritage. So it was quite striking for me that such a strong market-based approach to this consultation was taking place. And I think that's kind of reflective of two things. One, we're not trying hard enough to reframe the narrative. We need to change the narrative. We need to bring the author creator interest back to the forefront of these discussions because quite often they don't differ so much from what we're also saying, which is greater access to content, greater access to information and the ability to use information more freely while still protecting the rights of the creator. On, on quite a few issues, we're on the same page. The second thing that I find is quite striking then in this narrative is a lot of the discussions we have in the EU are about, well, can this be licensed? We start from the perspective of not should it be licensed, but would a licensing solution solve this particular issue? And we saw that borne out in the Licenses for Europe process, which I actually think demonstrated that licensing is not going to be the solution to quite a few of these issues. But that's the other part that was, for me, quite um, astonishing was this discussion that we keep having in the EU around, well, why would, explain to me why the license wouldn't work, rather than starting from the perspective of, for all new emerging technologies and all new uses of content, should they presumptively be licensed? And again, I think that's something that has been striking here in comparison to, for example, Australia, the United States, and we've done some work in Latin America where there's always at least in principle, very much this balance between the market and that broader public good. Whereas we talk about the public good in Europe, but actually in all of the discussions with the policymakers, the narrative that has been sold to them is an industry one. So we have a lot of work to do in reframing that narrative as not everything can be solved by the market, that there's a broader public good at issue here. So I would definitely say get ready to advocate, get in touch with your MEPs. We need to come up with our three messages to push back against that industry approach. Um, I'd also say from the EU copyright consultation perspective, we know that around the world now reform of exceptions and limitations is gathering speed. Australia just recommended the adoption of an open norm, in their case the fair use provision. We now have, I think, five or six uh, countries in Asia who have a fair use provision. Uh, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, Israel, the Philippines. What I find quite striking is some of these countries who have adopted more flexible provisions are also becoming most innovative in terms of their IT sectors. Republic of Korea, I think, is particularly interesting because they're also the fastest growing producer of content as well as also um, developing very, very rapidly in terms of IT. So it demonstrates that you can have more flexible copyright alongside strong protections for creators. And I was in a conversation with some people from DG Trade recently where we were talking about, well, we don't want to look at exceptions and limitations because this will be bad for us foreign policy-wise. And again, I thought 
We're not doing a good enough job reframing the narrative because why do you think the single biggest producer of intellectual property in the world, biggest exporter of intellectual property, has both flexible exceptions and robust protections? It's because it's in their domestic interests to pay as little as possible for overseas content, to limit their payments to foreign right holders, as well as export as much intellectual property as they can. This is why the United States is very protective of fair use in the international context, whilst trying to ensure as well that other countries don't adopt a flexible standard. We had a lot of interesting visits from the US ambassador in Australia when we were going through the copyright consultations, because even though it works in the US for many reasons, flexible exceptions wouldn't work in Australia. I don't know that the EU is ready for something as open as fair use or something that's that flexible, but again, we need to start reframing this narrative about an open norm is not about taking money from creators, it's about flexibility, it's about adaptability, it's about future-proofing. And then more fundamentally, just for my third point, the licensing discussion that we're having here in the European Union has also got me thinking about eventually, and maybe it's 20 years time, 30 years, maybe when everybody who knows about copyright as it exists now and grew up with print, Will we ever move away from the act of copying being at the centre of the copyright system? Because when we talk about licensing text and data mining, for example, or potentially licensing indexing and caching, we're talking about activities that only incidentally are copyright issues, as in they're not um, transgressing on the market for the work, but simply by the technical act of copying involved, they become a copyright issue. So we're instituting a toll system where the industry of the trolls under the bridge, I hope there's none of them here. I, I mean that in the most loving sense, but it gives you the ability to be the troll under the bridge for every new bridge that's created, for every new use, you can come out from underneath it and say, well, to cross it, you need to pay us a toll, regardless of whether they've contributed to the new service, um, added to the worth of the content, it's just a toll. And particularly for something like text and data mining, which libraries are very interested in, um, it strikes me that text and data mining has been taking place before the internet, before text and data mining as we call it. There's actually some really quite beautiful visual art that's been done by an artist, I think she's from Bulgaria actually, where she went through famous literary texts like uh, Jack Kerouac's On the Road and highlighted um, using a variety of colours and a variety of systems, all of the plot points in the novel, certain character references, to then create data visualisations. But she did this by hand. If she'd been using the internet, she would have done it in like half a day and it would look just as good. But the point remains that you can do it offline, it's slower, it's less efficient. We have the internet now which gives us these um, the benefits of efficiency, the ben benefits of speed and greater data-driven innovation, but because an act of copying is involved, it's then a copyright issue. So I think eventually at some point, not hopeful in the EU copyright consultation, but hopefully we can move away from copying being central to the copyright system. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, and now I would like uh, if Melanie could uh, give us her speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also going to talk to you a little about uh, this uh, European uh, consultation and about the necessity uh, to uh, change the, the framework and to, to develop a positive, uh, a positive uh, narrative. Uh, the, the problem is that currently copyright reform is all about proposing uh, more exceptions to, uh, to copyright for certain categories of, uh, of users, being teachers, libraries, uh, researchers, or the general uh, public, uh, for instance, for uh, non-commercial uh, sharing, uh, in order to improve access to knowledge. But uh, the problem is that these demands are uh, fitting uh, the, the systems. I don't like to, uh, to call them uh, exceptions. So the vocabulary of uh, which you employed of flexibility is, is much, uh, it's much better because it's, uh, it's a way towards being more, more positive. But when, when we're asking for exceptions or for, for flexibility, 
it's like we're begging while it, uh, it should be the norm. If we take, uh, again, the, the example of uh, text and, um, and data mining, uh, it should be considered as an extension of uh, the right to, to read. And, uh, of course, it should totally not be approached with uh, licensing uh, uh, policy, but it should not be approached as an additional uh, exception to, to copyright. Because if we consider uh, that in the framework of copyright and uh, asking an, for, for an exception in order to perform a simple act of text and, and data mining, it is a de facto uh, recognition that it would uh, not be a legitimate uh, usage, while it is an activity which is not and should not be uh, regulated by, by copyright. And uh, if we ask for an exception for it, it means we are sort of acknowledging uh, the, the system. So the problem with uh, the, the consultation is that almost every question was uh, framed uh, in the mindset of the right holders. Do you think this act or this act should be submitted to the authorization of the right holders, yes or no, and uh, it was it was very very difficult to uh, to frame our answers uh, differently. La Quadrature uh, du Net did an amazing work of presenting the, their answers in uh, in a different uh, frame. So I'm advocating for a different frame, but with Comunia we didn't even do it. We just replied uh, the questions because it was uh, it was less uh, less work. And uh, our problem, as you know, is that we are less people. We have less uh, less budget, less time. Uh, many of us are uh, volunteering, uh, while our opposite uh, lobbyists have uh, all the. Uh, have more, more means to, uh, to, to develop their, their policy. Well, there was, it's not exactly true that everything was uh, framed uh, in terms of asking for authorization uh, to the right holders in this uh, consultation. There was one question uh, about registration. So registration of copyright, this is a change of, uh, of perspective uh, because copyright so far is granted as the default uh, perspective. Even if you don't want it, uh, as soon as uh, you create something, uh, you, have, uh, you have copyright. And uh, you have to work really, really hard to, um, to, get, uh, to get rid uh, of it. There is currently work uh, being led at, uh, at WIPO to, to assess the validity of the voluntary dedication to, uh, to the public domain, which is when you are still alive and you don't have to wait to be dead and wait an additional uh, 70 plus uh, years uh, after it. And uh, with, with Comunia Association, uh, we're, we're trying to give a, little, a legal status to, to the public domain so that it would be uh, available for, for everybody to, to, build, uh, to build upon it. Uh, and also in order to avoid to have to say, okay, so what is the public domain? It's what uh, is not um, copyrightable. Uh, so it's not the right uh, frame uh, to, to present, uh, to present uh, the debate. So instead of that, uh, what we say is that public domain is the default and uh, copyright is uh, the exception. So that's the first sentence of, uh, of the Comunia Manifesto on the public domain. And it's not very innovative because uh, historically everything was in the public domain before copyright was, uh, was invented. And even nowadays, from a legal, very technical perspective, you have to fulfill a certain set of uh, criteria before uh, copyright can, can be applied. Well, believe it or not, but this... Uh, this sentence that public domain is the default and copyright is, uh, is the exception is highly uh, controversial and it's, uh, it's difficult to, to, to tell it in the presence of the representative of, uh, of uh, right holders because for them the copyright is uh, the default. But then our narrative problem is that we don't have any, any space 
to, to imagine uh, the public domain or, or the commons because all the, all the space, all the imaginary is, is occupied by, by property which is very easy to, to conceptualize. You're two years old, you know what it is. It's mine, it's not yours, give it back to me. While it's, uh, it's, it's really more difficult to, to imagine and to, to give a definition of, uh, of the public domain and of a related uh, notion, which is, uh, which is uh, the, the commons. These notions are really hard to, to define scientifically and also in, uh, in everyday uh, language. They are what, uh, what we care about. It's the infrastructure, uh, it's the, the goods and, and the services which should be uh, governed by, by communities and not only by uh, corporate interests or by, by the states. It's uh, what do not belong for the public domain to, to, right, uh, to right holders. And um, so all this uh, rhetoric of the public domain, of the commons, it's, uh, it's what uh, Amelia and those daughter has been uh, working uh, on in, in, in the, the European uh, Parliament. You can also apply uh, this, this rhetoric to uh, domains such as uh, personal uh, data. For, um, for instance, in the sense that it should not be sub submitted only to uh, corporate uh, interest or to, to state uh, scrutiny. So it's, it's really important, as uh, the previous speakers uh, said, that we manage to, to change the paradigm, to change uh, the, the perspective, and that we stop fighting with representatives of some of the right holders on, uh, on their uh, playgrounds, because the law was, was designed to protect their interest and uh, their vision and we, we really need to, to define our playground and uh, define positive rights for, for the commons, for the public, for, for the public domain, for, for the data and we should not just ask please give us an exception in your neoliberal system to, to accommodate one, one particular question. Well, in the short term, uh, of course, we should, because at, uh, at WIPO, we, we had uh, the treaty for, for the blinds, for the, the visually impaired people, and uh, that, that was a major step, first time an actual uh, right of the public was, was being discussed. And now, uh, next uh, item on, uh, on the, the agenda to be discussed at, uh, at WIPO will be the, the rights for, for libraries. So it's going to come first, and it's a very uh, important uh, objective. But the big picture is to, is to define our domain uh, positively. Uh, we have to, to imagine uh, them, like, uh, like physical commons, uh, green parks, or, or national parks, or sanctuary for, uh, for wildlife. Uh, these are images which, which are easier to, to convey uh, to the policy makers and uh, also to, to the journalists, to the, to the society in, in general, besides our circles of, uh, of friends, because we understand each other, because we know the, the technicalities of, uh, of the system. So once we will have managed to, to develop such a narrative, such an imaginary, we will be speaking on, on equal uh, grounds. Uh, with the other stakeholders and then the true copyright uh, reform and the true reform in general uh, can begin. Thank you very much and now of course I would like to pass the word to Gabriele. Your, your turn. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I'd like to react to some of the comments that have been made, and then uh, I'll make um, three points about um, the EU copyright reform from the perspective of uh, Article 19. Well, just to get back to some of the things that have been said, one of the things that struck me is that, um, as a, for example, just the very fact that Article 19 was invited to speak at this event, which is about EU copyright reform, um, in a way is already showing that the, move, the, the debate on, on copyright is, is moving forward. Uh, I'm a free speech advocate and a human rights lawyer. 
So for me, um, the way in which uh, Article 19 approaches the, the whole debate it, it is a very uh, different one. So I think this is already uh, something that is encouraging, but certainly um, the way in which we look at this debate is um, extremely, um, extremely different. And for us, the things that's changed that is on the one hand, the internet itself, because um, for us, it's very much an engine of free speech. And one of the basic conditions of the exercise of uh, freedom of expression at the same time, what we've seen is that even the copyright debate, fundamental rights have become much more important. And we've seen this with ACTA, where uh, an important trade agreement was defeated um, very much on the basis of uh, fundamental rights uh, arguments, the right to freedom of expression, the right to privacy, uh, and due process. And it's very true that um, Article 19 first got into this debate um, about two, three years ago. And for us, it was very surprising when we start, started looking at it, because in a way, as a free speech organization, free expression is so linked to copyright, what copyright stands for, which is innovation and creativity. And so, obviously, there is a very powerful link. Yet, somehow, there was no one there really talking about uh, free expression and how to balance copyright and freedom of expression. And what we found was this very ingrained way of looking at copyright. Everything was looked at through this prism where copyright was the principle, the norm, and everything else was the exception, whereas in our world, <laughs> things were very different. We were talking about free expression, and copyright might be a restriction on, on free expression that had to be justified. So for us, in a way, if we're going to talk about narratives, it, it was a very different one. Of course, under human rights law, it's also true to say that copyright is generally recognized under the right to, to property. But again, the way in which um, free expression and, and copyright are balanced it is again very uh, different and there's lots of very different tools of interpretation looking at how the rights can be restricted where in fact freedom of expression there has to be like really strong justification for restricting it whereas um, at least uh, in the European Convention of Human Rights Framework um, c c the right to property can more easily uh, be restricted by the state. So um, all this to say that Article 19 then uh, set to, to, to look at how this balancing uh, could be done. And if you want to find out more about it, I'll take this opportunity to put you to our right to share principles, where we've looked at this and the balancing um, uh, in the digital uh, environment. Now, just going back to, to the actual consultation itself, so for us, in a way, um, we saw this as uh, an opportunity, I want to be uh, uh, positive uh, about this, as an opportunity to, to, to redress the balance between free expression uh, and copyright. Of course, going through the, the consultation itself, um, there were at least two aspects which for us raised alarm bells, um, if you like. One was about caching and the other one was about uh, hyperlinking because both caching and hyperlinking for us is, is, the, is really how it's striking at the heart of how the internet works. So if there are any restrictions on it based on copyright, that's a very serious interference with the, with the right to, to free our expression. But here, luckily, um, uh, we've already seen some, some um, response to, to these types of copyright claims. So for example, in relation to caching, um, in, in the United Kingdom, there was an encouraging uh, decision in the Meltwater case where um, uh, the UK Supreme Court saw that um, there was an exception on the uh, copyright for temporary copies generated by internet users and that was, this was part of the technical process. And then what, what, what the court found was that to hold that, you know, that somehow um, there should be co uh, copyright holders authorization to, for cash copies. This was set, seen as um, penalizing millions of internet users, potentially making them liable, and there was no such equivalent uh, in the offline world. Unfortunately, the, the, the story didn't quite end there, and uh, the, the Supreme Court made a referral to, uh, to the European Court of 
justice. Nonetheless, uh, it does show that caching is really, if it were to be made subject to copyright, is really saying that somehow um, when people are browsing, somehow they should get copyright authorization. From a free speech perspective, it, it's, it's, it's a clear uh, violation of your right to, to, to freedom of expression. Now, turning to hyperlinking, again, um, in many ways, uh, hyperlinks is, is really very much about how the internet works. It uh, could be said that the internet itself is a series of uh, hyperlinks, but yet there was a question about hyperlinking um, in, in the questionnaire, uh, in, the, in the consultation which um, uh, we found um, a little uh, alarming. And in, ma in many ways, um, what we're seeing here is something that everybody takes for granted. I think here it's also actually something for people to, to be conscious of. It's like every, every, everybody thinks it's natural just to click on every link, yet you know, it's important also for people to realize that um, there are claims being made that when we're linking somehow um, uh, there could potentially be a copyright infringement because the, the material was not made available. So here, really, um, I think that it, it has to give food for thought, but it's also important to remember that um, from the perspective of human rights law and the exercise of the right to free expression, um, there are really strong arguments to be made that this is a serious interference and violation uh, of that right because having to ask for permission every time that one wants to click uh, on a hyperlink um, from our perspective would be a clear violation of uh, freedom of expression. Now, uh, on the more positive side, and go, go, going back to copyright exceptions, although I understand that this is language that in itself uh, uh, can be uh, problematic, yet it, um, it's a good thing to be able to think about how how to fix this, because clearly in practice there are issues. Uh, it may seem natural that there should be a, copy, a, a parody exception um, uh, under copyright law, yet uh, it exists under French law, it doesn't under English law. That leads to problems and so that something that may be legal in, in one state isn't in another. Um, here we would want to say that the answer is easy because under uh, freedom of expression, it, the, this is already where parody is protected. So it be protected. Parody is something that forms part of freedom of expression. Um, but in any event, um, uh, under a human rights law framework, um, what we would also want to say is that copyright exceptions have to, to become mandatory. The state just can't stay idle. And it's not just about market power because states under the human rights framework also have to promote uh, rights. And it's not just copyright that they have to protect, it's also free expression. So to that extent, since under the copyright system it's copyright exceptions that protect freedom of expression, they do have, they really do have to, to, to adopt uh, a framework um, where I, that, that offers strong protection, equal protection to all kinds of expression. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. I think we should continue the conversation. But there are many other aspects um, that are very relevant under the copyright framework to freedom of expression. One of those is enforcement of copyright law. There are several intersections with the human rights framework and um, potential interferences with the right to freedom of expression. So for that, I would invite again to you to have a look at the right to share principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, I thank you all of you. Um, as a uh, rather uneducated person in these matters, I've uh, learned a lot of stuff that I find uh, really interesting, so thank you. And now is the time for discussion and your questions. Uh, so I would like to ask you to raise your hand if you have a question or so, and uh, please to uh, switch the button uh, right next to your microphone so that everyone here can uh, hear you. Thank you. Okay. So just 
to understand how the movement is uh, getting organized, um, is there some kind of international network of people thinking and acting on the topic? Um, are we working together? Uh, and if not, how can we work together better? Um, yeah, I guess uh, you're asking me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, um, so far it's really been uh, very ad hoc. I mean, people just sort of find each other and it's usually the people who work together already do work together, but I mean, um, the more um, this gets, um, well, the more organizations start working uh, on the EU level and in Brussels, actually the easier it is to network. So for now, um, well, there is Copyright for Creativity, which is one platform where organizations join together. Um, at Wikimedia, as you might or might not know, we are very decentralized structure, so we have national chapters. Um, my job is basically to bring them together and to have them work together and to have a common position in Brussels. Um, Creative Commons uh, now started, um, well, started a few policy initiatives. So how it works so far is that we basically meet each other randomly at events and then we decide, hey, let's exchange emails and start working together. It's very decentralized, but one of the more, uh, let's say, um, platforms that is trying to give the whole thing uh, a permanent structure is copyright for creativity. And otherwise, you can always send us an email. So, yeah, that's at uh, the, the new initiative at, uh, at the European level. And otherwise, I completely agree, it's always ad hoc. We try to, to meet at, uh, at various conferences. Uh, but with a more historical perspective, internationally, there have been two, uh, two initiatives. So first, since three or four years, there is this uh, conference every year, which is called a Global Congress uh, for Intellectual Property and uh, the Public Interest. And uh, it's a place where people working in different areas have the opportunity to, to meet because as uh, Gabriel was, uh, was noticing, the people working uh, for copyright and the people working on freedom of expression uh, do not exactly have the same legal uh, reasoning and it's very important that, uh, that we, we discuss to, to define uh, in, in, in common the, uh, the solution. And uh, also, I think we could say that we all belong to the broad community of access to, to knowledge. There has been sort of a shadow uh, WIPO treaty on access to knowledge, which uh, has been written um, many, many, many years ago, and uh, it, uh, it gathers uh, people from various countries working uh, uh, for, for the disabled people, uh, the libraries, uh, and also access to, to medicine. So these would be our, our communities. And perhaps if I briefly mention copyright for creativity, so that was the initiative set up at the EU level to respond to the copyright consultation process, and it was the, it was the coalition builder, so it's all sectors, um, EDRI is involved, as well as CCIA, for example, the Computer and Communications Industry Association, as well as libraries, educators, so it's designed to be an umbrella. Um, the one observation I would make is um, the challenge is always, so for example, copyright for creativity is working really well, as in it's got a fantastic team coordinating all of these organisations, except financing and numbers is always a huge issue. So we, as C4C, have kind of met concertedly with all of the DGs that are directly or indirectly involved in copyright. We've met with some MEPs, and this is all within the space of like the last three weeks. And every time we come out of a meeting we think like for every one week that we go to visit them the publishers have been three times that week like that is how strong the messaging is in brussels so um umbrella organization is always really good and it's numbers that are needed it's like how what what mailing list is the best one to use where should we all join together i'd say c for c i think there's over a hundred organizations now that are signatories of c for c so they're definitely trying to build it um maybe it's, I, I, you'll have to look at the website to see who signed but that's what it's designed for but then it's how we actually get all of these organizations to knock on the doors themselves to actually push the message as well one final thing, yeah, well, because the idea is to sort of organize ourselves, but actually 
uh, and therefore we need these umbrella organizations and I think we need to especially mention EDRI here who is just uh, who are just uh, the pan-European NGO umbrella organization doing everything digital but um, actually in the end uh, we have a greater interest if we answer the consultation as separate organizations so they think we're more than we actually are <laughs> so yeah <laughs> well <laughs> they know but they, we think they don't know so yes thanks uh, thank you. Uh, now you, you're asking to switch. Yeah, so some of you have mentioned the, uh, the reduction in the duration of copyright. I think it was you, Dimitri. And uh, so I'm a bit more radical myself. I'm more for almost abolishing copyright to have enough copyright just to have copy left and nothing, and not, nothing more than that. But I guess that having a reduction in copyright terms would be a more realistic goal, at least in the short term. So I wonder if you have in mind plans or if you're aware of any studies which actually studied what would be the appropriate copyright duration in specific fields which have been like introduced with mm, digital technologies, like what would be the appropriate copyright duration for software or for digital media or for different kinds of content production we now have and which to which we have applied uh, copyright duration which are were for the totally inappropriate for a more rapidly changing environment than painter than painters or this kind of stuff thank you well there was actually a study on that i can look for the name later i don't have i don't know it off by heart but i think it came up with the perfect balance between culture and industry and then in the end they said it should be around 14 years um, this is uh, impossible. We're not even asking for this, not even in the copyright consultation is Wikimedia, although we are asking for a shortening because that's the funny thing with international trade agreements. Even if the EU really unanimously wanted to um, to uh, put uh, to shorten the copyright terms, they couldn't go shorter than 50 years, which is the Berne Convention minimum. So we are also very much afraid to have IP in international trade agreements because you sign up to something that is basically non-changeable over a really long time. Um, when I go around and talk about uh, shorter copyright terms, I um, have um, experienced that the most uh, effective and the most productive way to do this is to just say we want copyright terms as long as patent terms, and patent terms are I think 14 to 20 years depending on what you're doing because then if somebody tells you it's too short and then you can just bring the argument yeah but it's not too short for if you invent a new laser why should it be too short when you invent new music and nobody wants to to have longer patent terms because everybody will tell you that it will ruin the economy so i think that's the best um the best way to go about it just say we want them as short as patent terms just on some specific studies i remember that paul healed from the university of virginia did one on the um on books, like the point at which they fall out of commerce, the impact longer copyright terms are having on them. So that's one. Um, definitely, um, we don't really talk a lot about the extended copyright term because, as Dimi has said, um, TRIPS standard is 50 years. So we have said, well, the EU can reduce its term to 50 years in compliance with TRIPS. But um, the reality is it can't really go any lower unless we went back and amended TRIPS, the Berne Convention. Um, the other point that I was going to make is we quite often find it useful to think about other ways of reducing the sheer amount of content that is copyright protected, perhaps getting guidance in legislation um, that creates a higher standard for originality, for example. So instead of getting this huge amount of content that we now have capable of copyright protection, whether it's like a published literary work or not, that we might get some guidance around like what is the standard for originality, because in a lot of countries it's actually incredibly low. Like I don't know about the EU, but the UK it's like skill and labour. So it literally means like I wrote some notes on this piece of paper right here and now they're copyright protected. So th there's other ways in which we might be able to reduce the scope. Yes, an additional uh, way is to uh, work towards uh, solutions similar to, uh, to registration. If you want to have a look at uh, copyright 2.0, it's a paper written, uh, you're familiar with it, okay, by, uh, by Marco Ricolfi, and uh, it would say, okay, so the default which you get is similar to, uh, as uh, you were saying, uh, a Creative Commons uh, license, but this time with a non-commercial um, uh, option. And then if you want more, uh, you have to, to register. So there, there are 
rooms uh, for, for, for adaptation which would not require to, uh, to open the Pandora box of, uh, of Berlin. <laughs> Uh, thank uh, you just, very much. Uh, sorry, just sorry. to um, make an additional comment, I mean, actually essentially reiterating that from a legal point of view on copyright terms, it's uh, very limited. There's very little room for maneuver because of these uh, international treaties and the Berne Convention in particular in relation to copyright. Um, but w which in many ways is extremely frustrating given the, a number of like, reports that have actually pointed that there's no support to the idea that um, having long copyright terms make people more creative. So, for example, I'd just like to point to the uh, UK's 2011, there was a Hargreaves uh, review of intellectual property and growth, and I'm quoting, economic evidence is clear that the likely de dead weight loss to the economy exceeds any additional incentive incentivizing effect which might result from the extension of copyright term beyond its current levels. An international study found term extension to have no impact on output. So. And it makes the question of orphan works uh, even worse. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hear a question. I would like to ask you about uh, an opinion about the statement that was made by the French composer Jean-Michel Jarre, who is uh, chairman of the CISAC, an international composer organization. He said in, uh, in a statement that he felt that uh, it's quite counterproductive to sue ordinary people for sharing files on the internet and so on, but he, his opinion was that we should uh, make more uh, that the companies who are, are earning money more or less on making the internet smarter and mobile phones smarter and so on. He, he thought that they should uh, pay more money instead in this uh, in financial solutions to the copyright dilemma. What's your opinion on those matters? I would like to hear you uh, tell your opinions about that. Thank you. Uh, I, I would say that it's very French to propose a new tax to solve uh, a, new, <laughs> a, new, a new problem. Uh, it, of course, it's good to not go after the individual person. So on, uh, on that, I will, uh, I will not, uh, I will not uh, disagree. Uh, but it reminds me that CISAC, at some point, I was uh, representing Creative Commons to discuss with, with Collecting Society, and uh, I went to a congress of CISAC to explain the problem uh, of Creative Commons licenses users who wanted to also be part of the system and be a member of a collecting society and use the good service of the collecting society to collect uh, royalties for commercial use when they were using a, a NC, NC license. And uh, not only worse than absolutely not understanding what I was talking about. I needed 10 minutes to say what I just told you in, in uh, five seconds. But also the question was, but are you all your free people? We, we, we're all the same anyhow at, at, at this table for, for, for them. It was a few years ago. Are you anyway not all funded by, by Google? And uh, are you just uh, not a cybernetic sect? A cult. So that was the, the opinion of uh, of uh, of Cizac on uh, on us. So I, I think there are, it's a big g cultural uh, gap between uh, between us. Um, I don't know the statement, but I've heard it described the intermediaries being either liable for infringing content or should be paying taxes to either um, transfer content using their services or host it on sites, for example. So on infringing content, obviously from a library's perspective, we think that to some extent, if you're aware of infringing content, like in a library, if we were aware of copyright infringing activity taking place as 
institutions who respect the rights of the author, we'd be trying to prevent it, not from an encroaching on individual rights perspective, but that's why there's been lots of um, small pieces of legislation around libraries having to have notices next to photocopiers telling the students that they can't copy more than whatever is allowed under their fair dealing provisions. So from an infringing perspective, um, that's clearly been the uh, goal behind things like safe harbour provisions in US law, that to the extent that as a internet intermediary you're aware of infringing content taking place specifically and you have the means to take it down, I think as a library representative we, we don't see that as problematic. Where we do see it as really problematic is when we're talking about taxing or requiring internet intermediaries to license what would otherwise be harmless activities. So when we hear of um, internet intermediaries, it being proposed that they pay a license fee to provide hyperlinks or um, to index content or cache content. Because we talk a lot about Google. Google comes up in all conversations, but actually like creating a licensing situation for internet intermediaries really only grows monopolies like Google's because startups aren't going to be able to afford to operate in a licensing environment, but Google could afford to um, pay taxes in, say, four of the 28 U uh, EU member states. So it actually prevents competition in the IT sector. So that would be my perspective on whether a lot of internet activities that are harmless should be licensed or not, or that they should pay. Yeah, I have a similar um, problem with such a statement because it basically draws again a line between um, content provider, content producer and user. Well, one of the single biggest benefits of this internet and this new culture is that the user becomes the, the content provider. And then um, this would again be some solution that really draws a clear line between the two. And I think a really um, future oriented solution uh, needs to take um, this new double role of each individual into account. Um, we haven't seen yet a workable solution since we all agree that uh, basing copyright on copies is, is wrong, but we also all, also all probably agree that the authors need to have some rights. Uh, so we need to find a new solution how to, how to balance these two things. There are, a few, um, there are a few proposals. I think in Germany somebody proposed a token system in Norway, the National Library just put their entire catalog online for free, and then they're gonna pay uh, the the authors, uh, depending on how many page views each book gets. Um, there are a few things uh, happening now, but uh, we still haven't found a, a, a really um, convincing solution, to be honest. And just to add briefly uh, on the uh, prosecution of users uh, aspect, that's one of the key issues from a human rights perspective and a free speech perspective. Um, usually one of the key intersections uh, for us uh, between freedom of expression and copyright uh, has to do with uh, enforcement uh, measures. So for instance, uh, criminalization of non-commercial copyright, um, so where uh, users may uh, end up in jail for um, say, downloading two songs. Um, some measures uh, such as these exist in, in some countries, including in Asia. Uh, so that's, that's a real issue that, and that we see as a violation of free expression and um, measures around internet disconnection and so forth. Um, it's more difficult to use the rights framework uh, in the context of um, what's commercial. It really has to be it goes back to the to the user. So it, human rights law doesn't really offer um, business type of solutions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, here's the next question. Yeah, one of the uh, most interesting pieces of news that I heard this conference already uh, uh, is in a conversation before the session uh, was a, about a German organization, you've probably heard of it already, uh, that is uh, an author's organization but based on uh, creative commons. Uh, so I found that a, an extremely interesting concept where, uh, you know, it's a CC-based uh, author's organization. 
uh, which has tremendous implications for the rent-seeking behavior of uh, typical authors' organizations. So I, it's kind of an open question. What's, what's your view on that? Um, and I think one of the most interesting things is, is like how, uh, how do you think that authors or non-authors or anything in between uh, would respond to that idea? Well, I, I think it's really surprising that there are not more initiatives uh, like uh, uh, like this and that uh, they are only getting uh, developed now. It's been uh, 10 years, uh, but maybe it's a lot of work and as we're all volunteers, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, it's it's difficult. But uh, yeah, everybody uh, involved should try to test new models and try to, to find a remuneration uh, where, uh, where it's possible to, it's very, it's a very simple, uh, simple answer, but uh, yes, it's innovative and I'm sure there are other models to be, uh, to be tested, uh, tested around the compatibility between having free access and, uh, and, uh, and getting a remuneration. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of free choice, so I, I really like this. I think it's C3, uh, C, uh, yes, 3S, yeah, something like that. Um, the problem is that within the EU, in many EU member states, um, collecting societies are legal monopolies. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't build up a competing organization. So this is, might be a good solution for Germany, but um, yeah, globally it, it can't solve things, yes. If I, yeah, if I may, we actually discussed that uh, Holland apparently has a quasi-monopoly uh, and we actually thought, well, that would be an interesting European court case. So if everybody, uh, if anybody would be interested in doing that, challenging uh, uh, authors' organizations' monopolies would be uh, a wedge that you could drive into the entire copyright industry right there. Contact Daft Punk, they tried 10 or 15 years ago. Really? There, yeah, yeah, there is okay. a case law at the European Court of Justice. I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> also, there was, um, I mean, the Collective Rights Management Directive just passed, I think, in February in the Strasbourg session. And um, we were actually, um, one of the things we were pushing for is to, um, because right now, not only that they are legal monopolies, but even the authors do not have the right to license their music, their works, uh, under a free license. So according to the new directive, they must be granted this right, but it was included only for non-commercial uses. Well, um, um, well, we were actually pushing for them to have the right to register sing single works uh, uh, as they wish, uh, which was not also granted. They're only allowed to grant uh, non-commercial uh, licenses for entire category of works, not for single songs which is a huge problem. We have musicians coming and saying, we want to donate one song to Wikipedia so it can be out there uh, on our Wikipedia article, and they're not allowed to do this because they, they can either put the en entire library under, uh, I mean, just cancel the contract, or they're not allowed to put individual songs under a free license. I mean, this is also something really ridiculous, but it's in the new directive they kept it. Uh, okay, if there are no further comments uh, from you, uh, then I uh, will unfortunately have to end this because we ran out of, out of time. But I really thank you for you to come here today and for this gorgeous discussion. And uh, of course, I also thank you for that you, was, uh, you were able to come here today and talk to us. Uh, okay, uh, so thank you again uh, very much.